According to Ugaki, Yamamoto informally agreed with the decision and ordered the first air fleet to submit to the Navy Ministry a list of those for whom they desired such promotions. Both of them should have known that Kusaka was much too fair-minded to thus pick and choose among his heroic dead. At 13 on May 19, while Yamato lay at mooring buoy in Hashirajima, Nagumo and Kusaka came aboard, and the latter again discussed the problem. But it was settled to adhere to the decided policy, as Ugaki noted. And there the matter rested. This little intra-service squabble would not be worth recording had it not contained rather disturbing overtones. The immediate honouring of the submariners, the relative ignoring of the flyers, indicated unmistakably that the combined fleet still had not quite accepted the airmen into the full brotherhood of the sea. That same day, Miwa tangled with Kuroshima over the second battleship division. He preferred to take it out of the combined fleet and use it for training purposes, whereas Kuroshima insisted that it participate in the midway operation. Miwa had a nagging fear that the US Pacific Fleet would not show up as anticipated, and thus what to him was the main point of the massive foray would be lost. Nevertheless, the next day Yamamoto issued an official order for the fleet tactical forces to participate, as predicated in the war games. It included an estimate of enemy forces at Midway, Hawaii and the Aleutians, shrugging off the latter as possessing no substantial United States installations or strength except at Dutch Harbour. In the Hawaiian area, the Japanese deduced the following units, which probably would sortie in the event of an attack on Midway. Two to three aircraft carriers, two to three special carriers, two battleships, four or five Type A cruisers, three to four Type B cruisers, four light cruisers, approximately 30 destroyers, and 25 submarines. As of that date, this was correct as to large carriers, cruisers of all types, destroyers and submarines. But the Americans had no special carriers or battleships in the Central Pacific, and by the time battle was joined, only eight cruisers and 14 destroyers remained in the Midway area, the rest having been sent to the Aleutians. The estimate of two or three carriers was based upon the possibility that one of the craft reported sunk in the Coral Sea might have been only damaged, and that WASP, whose whereabouts remained a profound mystery to the Japanese, might be in the Pacific. The estimate also took into consideration possible American aircraft in the Hawaiian area, for these could be sent to Midway immediately in an emergency. This air power was considered to be around 60 flying boats, 100 bombers, and 200 fighters. This was not a bad estimate, although not absolutely accurate. According to the best information available to Yamamoto, the Midway garrison comprised two squadrons of flying boats, that is, 24 craft, one squadron of army bombers and one fighter squadron of 20 planes. This strength could be doubled in an emergency, according to the intelligence report. In addition, Midway was conducting day and night air patrol to a distance of some 600 miles westward, and at least three fighters covered the atoll at all times. These air patrols were reinforced by surface craft and a few submarines. The report also indicated that large numbers of various types of level and high-angle large-caliber guns, as well as high-angle machine guns, have been installed. Marines had been landed, and all in all the island was very strongly defended. All of which was reasonably correct. These estimates provided further arguments for knocking Midway down to size with a powerful air attack or two before sending in the landing force. In a way, the two islets hypnotised Yamamoto and his command more and more as the planning, training and preparations for the coming operations unfolded. Speculation was rife in the press as to where the Japanese would strike next. In an article by Julius Edelstein, datelined Washington May 15, the Honolulu advertiser remarked, Expert observers here today anticipate a Japanese spring offensive against Alaska and Hawaii. Alaska is the military keystone to the North Pacific and prime objective for an attack which was believed to have been deterred by winter. But an attack has been expected in some quarters since Pearl Harbor General Delos C. Emmons, military governor of Hawaii, has warned the public that assaults are expected against Hawaii. Nimitz was quite sure that he could rule out Hawaii as a Japanese objective in the upcoming campaign, but he had to determine what to do about the threat to Alaska. He could not simply ignore it even though he was sure this was basically a Japanese feint. 
On May 17, he decided upon a North Pacific force under the command of Rear Admiral Robert A. Theobald, consisting of the heavy cruisers Indianapolis and Louisville, the light cruisers Honolulu, St. Louis and Nashville, and ten destroyers. Then, too, there was his responsibility to hold the lifeline between the United States and Australia. His choice indicated breadth of vision. He would continue the normal convoy movement, even though it meant sparing an appreciable number of destroyers from the Midway defence. He had a strong battleship force under his command, which he could have committed to Midway had he so desired. Task Force One, composed of Pennsylvania, Maryland, Colorado, Idaho, Tennessee, New Mexico and Mississippi, with eight destroyers and the escort carrier Long Island, were stationed at San Francisco under the command of Admiral Pai, whom Nimitz had succeeded as Commander-in-Chief Pacific. Full consideration was given to employment of Task Force One in the defence of Midway, Nimitz reported to King after the battle. It was not moved out because of the undesirability of diverting to its screen any units which could add to our long-range striking power against the enemy carriers. Undoubtedly, other considerations entered the picture, for he diverted to the Aleutian Theatre screening units which he certainly could have used at Midway. Both he and King estimated that the enemy's plans included an attempt to trap a large part of our fleet. The battleship force was too slow to operate with the swift carrier forces, and Nimitz could spare no air cover to augment Long Island, which carried only 20 planes. Perhaps a less tangible element entered his calculations, an officer who knew both admirals indicated that Nimitz did not have complete faith in Pai, the great brain but no guts, and hesitated to trust him against the Japanese beyond a certain point. Be that as it may, Nimitz's decision was both far-sighted and daring in the context of the time. Here was a clean break with tradition. For years the United States Navy had clung to the concept of the battleship as Queen of the Seas, yet within six months after Pearl Harbor, a seriously outnumbered commander-in-chief, Pacific could deliberately set aside his battle wagons. Nimitz was not an airman, while Yamamoto was the titular champion of naval air power, but it was the American who resolved to take no dead wood to Midway. What he did want at the ready was air power and plenty of it. On May 18, the 7th Air Force, under the command of Major General Clarence L. Tinker, was placed on a special alert in preparation for meeting a threatened enemy attack. Tinker's best combat weapon at the time was the four-engined B-17 bomber, the legendary Flying Fortress, which could carry a heavy bomb load over long distances. But Tinker and his bomber commander, Brigadier General H.C. Davidson, had only 27 B-17s suitable to strike Yamamoto's vast sea forces, when and if they poked their prows over the horizon. Heretofore, the 7th Air Force had used the Flying Fortress both for search and strike purposes. After the special alert of May 18, however, Davidson used no B-17s on a search mission for about 10 days. Instead, they were held loaded with 500 and 600 pound demolition bombs as a striking force. From May 18 on, new B-17s arrived from the mainland in increasing numbers. Usually they landed on Oahu in the morning and at once were hustled over to the shops of the air depot. Their maintenance crews removed their extra fuel tanks used on the long flight from the west coast. Then the crews installed auxiliary tanks in the radio compartment and checked their equipment and armament. These new planes generally were turned over to the tactical units within 24 hours to be used either on Oahu or flown post-haste to Midway. These preparations began none too soon, for Japanese fleet units had already begun to sortie. On May 20, Tanaka's Midway Transport Group left Japan's large naval bases of Yokosuka and Kura and headed for Saipan, the assembly point some 750 miles from Japan. There, this tough, experienced admiral would await further orders and sail on to Midway at the appointed time. His convoy included, among others, 11 troop transports, several cargo vessels and oilers, auxiliary craft and escorts, more than 40 ships in all. These transports carried the Midway landing force of approximately 5,000 troops, almost equally divided between soldiers and sailors, under the overall command of Navy Captain Minoru Ota. It comprised the second combined special naval landing force, directly under Ota, as well as the Army's Ichiki detachment under Colonel Kiyonao Ichiki. Japanese Navy units usually bore numerical designations, 
while those of the army were known by the name of their commander. By knowing the rank of the commander, a clever intelligence agent could make a fairly accurate guess as to the unit's strength. A seaplane tender group under Admiral Fujita moved out with Tanaka's convoy. It was composed of the seaplane carrier Chitose, which held 16 fighter seaplanes and four scout seaplanes, and the Kamikawa Maru, an auxiliary carrier with eight fighter seaplanes and four scout planes. The destroyer Hayashio provided protection and patrol boat number 35 carried troops for its special mission. This group was to occupy Kura Island and set up a seaplane base there. These ships were all a part of a single, complex plan for taking and holding Midway. It was a big enterprise, for Midway lay in the Central Pacific some 2200 miles from Japan's home bases, and only about half that distance from Oahu. With a core area in her four main islands not much larger than California, Japan was already fighting over vast areas of the Pacific and Asia. Yet she was embarking on yet another expansionist venture. Consider the manpower, resources, ships and organization necessary to equip, transport, supply and maintain Japanese forces of all types in these multiple areas. For they were in the home islands, in the Kuriles, on Sakhalin, in Korea, Manchuria, China, Formosa, French Indochina, the Philippines, Malaya, the Netherlands East Indies, Wake, Guam, Saipan, Tinian, New Britain, the Solomons, the Carolines, the Marshalls, New Guinea and elsewhere. One need only think in general terms concerning the components of such an effort to have some kind of picture of the immensity of the problem the Japanese had tackled when they made their reckless plunge to glory on December 7, 1941, and what they were up to at Midway. Because US submarines were on the prowl, Tanaka had an escort of ten of Japan's best destroyers with their incongruously poetic names. Some of them were Pearl Harbor veterans like Shiranuhi, Phosphorescent Foam, Kasumi, Mist of Flowers, Arare, Hale, and Kagero, Gossamer. These were swift, powerful ships displacing roughly 2,000 tons, bearing eight 24-inch torpedo tubes and six 5-inch .50 caliber guns mounted in covered pairs. According to plan, the destroyer skippers would not know their ultimate destination until they reached Saipan, but at least one of them was in on the scheme, thanks to Tanaka himself. On May 20, at Kure, he confided the news to Lieutenant Commander Tamechi Hara, commanding Amatsukaze. Hara had been caught up in a wholesale whirl of personnel changes at Kure, and by mid-May had lost nearly all his experienced officers and a good half of his crew. He estimated that at least two months would be necessary to bring Amatsukaze back to her fighting form, and most of his fellow destroyer skippers were in the same situation. Hara's immediate reaction to Tanaka's information was indicative of the man, he looked at Tanaka as though the high command had lost its individual and collective mind. Then he yammered excitedly. What? What does this mean, Admiral? Are we going to conduct it with this crew? Tanaka shushed his outspoken subordinate and admitted, As a matter of fact, I am not sure about it. I hope it's untrue. But it was true enough, so at least one of Tanaka's escort commanders was sailing for Saipan in a mood considerably short of ecstatic. Lieutenant Commander Sadao Chigusa, the gunnery officer of the light cruiser Jintsu, remembered this voyage vividly, thanks in part to his detailed war diary. The cruise to Saipan was calm and smooth with loads of sunshine, bright blue skies and soft breezes, he recalled. It was enough to raise anyone's spirits. But he remembered, too, being tired physically and mentally. There was no rest, there was no rest, he repeated. I was a human being like all the others, and we were tired before we left for the battle area. We never doubted our success for a minute, yet we were so tired. Chigusa was an intelligent, medium-sized man with a pleasant disposition, twinkling eyes, and a modest nature. He had been executive officer of the destroyer Akigumo during the Pearl Harbor operation, and he had just returned from the Indian Ocean campaign in April when he transferred to Jintsu. The cruiser engaged in training for Midway in Hiroshima Bay, the main objective was to achieve accurate gunfire against land targets, because Jintsu was to help support the landing forces by shore bombardment. Chigusa learned about Midway toward the end of April, and he had studied the operation in detail. With Pearl Harbor and the Indian Ocean victories as a background for his thinking, Chigusa told himself en route to Saipan, War is very simple. We can do it. Midway will be very easy. 
Nobody on the American side kidded himself that defending Midway would be very easy. The atoll swarmed with preparations to repel invasion. Little Eastern Island, the triangular eastern half of the atoll, almost sunk under the weight of its own build-up. The entire installation was a hectic melange of harried leaders, new personnel, mixed aircraft, ever-thirsty gasoline tanks, and goonie birds, a local type of albatross. In the words of Lieutenant Colonel Ira E. Kimes, commander of the Marine Air Group, when we got information of what we were up against, it seemed that we had a million things to do and no time to do them in. The result was that we worked night and day, just short of the point where people would be too exhausted to take part in the defence. May 21 saw the beginning of the Midway Operations Alert Phase. Before that date, MAG-22, consisting of Scout Bombing Squadron 241, Fighter Squadron 221, and a modest headquarters and service squadron, was the only air unit on Eastern Island. The group comprised 47 officers and 335 men, with 21 F-2A3 aircraft and 21 SB-2U-3S, of which only 17 were available for use. Even this relatively small population was a strain on the housing and messing facilities, and already some enlisted men lacked dugout bunks. However, enough bunkers were available to hold all the planes. In the pre-reconnaissance flight period, normal daily gasoline consumption was around 1,500 gallons. For this, the local stowage system was adequate, consisting of a main unit of 100,000 gallons with a reserve of 51,000 gallons, all in underground tanks, along with an additional emergency supply of about 25,000 gallon drums dispersed at strategic points around the field. A 15,000 gallon barge from which gasoline was pumped into the main system kept the supply current, and in addition, two 1,200 gallon tank trucks were available. Ammunition dumps dotted around the island held approximately 37 1,000 pound. Bombs, 216 of the 500 pounders, and 280 100 pound bombs, along with 23 MK-171 depth charges. Also available were 22,000 rounds each of 0.5 calibre and 0.3 calibre ammunition. Underground tanks held some 25,000 gallons of fresh water, with another 20,000 gallons stored in exposed tanks. The fresh water was strictly for drinking and cooking, seawater being pumped in for bathing and flushing. This routine was shortly due for an abrupt change, as Nimitz later wrote, Midway was meanwhile given all the strengthening that it could take. The awkward fact remained, however, that Midway itself could support an air force only about the size of a carrier group. Therefore, despite a heavy inflow of planes from the mainland to Oahu and from there to Midway, the available numbers were never large enough to give a comfortable margin for losses. That the highest army levels in Washington were by no means sold on Midway is evident from Stimson's diary. For several days we have been getting rather alarming rumours of concentration by the Japs to make a revenge attack upon us for the bombing of Tokyo. They are well authenticated, and we are now worried about the place where they may come, which may be anywhere from Alaska, the West Coast or Panama. George Marshall is troubled about it, and told me this afternoon that he is going to go out to the West Coast to look things over. Later that afternoon, May 21, Stimson found Marshall discussing the subject with representatives of the Air Force and G2, Army Intelligence, with reference to the possible attack by the Japanese upon our plants in San Diego, and then a flight by those Japs down into Mexico after they have made their attack. In other words, he feared that the Japanese would follow the pattern of the Doolittle Raiders, who had hit Japan, then flown on to China. So Stimson asked State to touch base with their people south of the border. Marshall flew to the west coast the afternoon of May 22, because we think there is a very real danger of a Japanese raid very soon on some part of the coast, and very likely in the southern part. Evidently, some second thoughts troubled a few minds in Japan. Although there are considerably strong voices heard suggesting postponement of the coming operation because of the delay in preparations, it was decided to force through the original plan, wrote Miwa. This decision involves a very delicate point. Too much of a tall order is not good at all, and too much of a soft attitude towards such suggestions is no good either. Neither Shokaku nor Zuikaku had progressed far enough in refurbishing to make the original date, and submarine repairs were dragging, 
Yet the Japanese decided to go ahead as planned because if they upset the schedule, at least a month would elapse before the moonlight would be propitious for a possible night landing on Midway. At dawn of May 22, Yamamoto's main body sailed through Bungo Strait, bound for brief sea exercises, passing the 5th and 6th cruiser divisions returning homeward. Yamato courteously signalled congratulations on the Coral Sea victory, but the cruisers did not reply. Miwa wondered if this failure to acknowledge was out of their consciousness for their poor conduct in the battle. At eight, the ten battleships started manoeuvring. As these great vessels split the seas in thunderous crashes, who could have believed that this was the last time the Imperial Japanese Navy would engage in major open sea manoeuvres? They trained straight through the day until midnight, when they headed for temporary anchorage. Dead tired, Miwa ended his journal notation for the day. The same expression could have applied to Major Vern J. McCall, executive officer of MAG-22, who on May 22 initiated what he termed the search and reconnaissance phase on Midway. Eastern Island began to jump. VP-44, consisting of six PBY-5As, 20 officers and 40 enlisted men, arrived from Pearl Harbor. At once, the defenders commenced work on 12 additional plane bunkers and stepped up camouflage on important installations. A new radio frequency plan went into effect and all aircraft were calibrated to the new frequencies. Significantly, the day's routine MAG-22 patrol consumed about 8,000 gallons of gasoline, almost five times the normal daily consumption. On May 23, the remaining six PBYs of VP-44 flew in with 21 officers and 40 enlisted men. On this day too, six PBYs arched out on a search mission to a 600-mile circle, and gasoline use doubled over the previous day. Yamamoto's main body returned to Hashirajima at 17 on May 23, and the next afternoon, Admiral Hara reported to Yamamoto and his staff on the Coral Sea battle. What he said is quite true, Ugaki admitted. On 7 May, he was so little favoured by the chance of launching an attack that he would have liked to quit the Navy. On the following day, he could manage to inflict damage upon the enemy, but his division also received damage. The situation became so complicated that he lacked the boldness to expand his achievement, though he was well aware of the necessity, only obeying instructions issued from above such as to head north and to make attacks. Ugaki might be appeased, but Miwa was not impressed. I cannot help feeling that admirals are a little bit spiritless, he confided to his diary. They seem to forget that a battle is won by those who never give up, and also that war damage sustained appears to be greater than that inflicted upon an enemy. As such, flying officers of Lieutenant Commander and Lieutenant Class are more spirited than they. It can't be helped if they are laughed at. This judgment was rather rough on King Kong, whose airmen were responsible for the main damage the Japanese inflicted on the Americans in that engagement. Junior officers can afford the luxury of reckless valour. The fate of thousands of men and of great ships does not rest on their actions. Moreover, both Ugaki's excuses and Miwa's scorn clearly reflect that Yamamoto's staff was not quite as overjoyed with the results of the Coral Sea fight as was the Japanese press. Before the attacking forces left the homeland, certain questions and problems still remained for the Japanese to resolve. So at 8.30 on May 24, the naval clan gathered once more aboard Yamato for a second tabletop manoeuvre for Midway and the Aleutians. At the centre stood Yamamoto, surrounded by his loyal staff, Ugaki, Kuroshima, Watanabe, Miwa and others. Each man had full confidence in his beloved chief, the bold Pearl Harbor strategist. How could the plans of this victorious leader go awry? The manoeuvres went off smoothly and according to plan. That afternoon, Yamamoto held a critique of the operation, during which this specific question arose, what steps should the northern force take in case an enemy fleet came out to meet it? Those present generally agreed that an air raid upon Dutch harbour should be carried out as planned unless a powerful enemy comes out. Kuroshima spoke deliberately yet forcefully. An invasion operation should be carried out as a main objective, but this principle is not to be applied to a case in which there is a chance of catching and destroying an enemy force including carriers. Ugaki turned to Captain Tasuku Nakazawa, Chief of Staff of the Fifth Fleet, the only representative of the Northern Force present. May the midway operation be carried out as originally planned, 
Even if the northern operation is found to be impossible, he asked. We don't have any objection to that, replied Nakazawa. Miwa had been listening attentively and now spoke up. In that case, he reasoned, the invasion operation should be called off for a while, and an engagement with the enemy force should be sought. At this point, Ugaki delivered a little speech stressing the need for accurate reporting of the enemy situation by reconnaissance aircraft. Then Miwa resumed, When enemy forces come out both in the north and south, it may be safely assumed that the enemy force in the south is more powerful than that in the north. For instance, if two regular carriers and two converted carriers with several battleships come out to meet us, it may be assumed that the southern force consists of the two regular ones, and the northern force of the two converted ones. In case an enemy force comes out to the south of the island chain, our northern force may be ordered to come down to the south to join our main forces, depending upon the prevailing circumstances. In case a powerful enemy force comes out to the north, our northern force will try to lure it to the southwest, so that our main force may attack it jointly. On the other hand, in case an enemy force is located east of 160 degree west, Submarine attacks will be repeated upon it, and the main task force will seek an opportunity to attack it. Depending upon weather conditions, the invasion operation may be postponed. Knock out the enemy ships if at all possible. This would be putting first things first. In solemn reflection, Kuroshima meshed his mental gears once more. We must not depend upon the air forces too much, and the surface forces must be ready to sacrifice themselves when necessary. This observation he offered as a private opinion. Ugaki, who often differed from Kuroshima, confirmed him on this point. Although air forces are good weapons to hit the enemy at a weak point, a case may arise where this principle cannot be applied. He further stressed the vulnerability of carriers, quoting in support of this Hara's Coral Sea report. As usual, Ugaki had the last word. I am pleased, as you are, to see that we have completed the necessary preparations to launch the operation at the scheduled time, he purred. Then he scored a note of caution. Since this operation involves a bulk of forces and extends over vast areas, we will have to expect that the entirely unexpected could happen at any time. So I must stress the need for maintaining coordination among forces, not hesitating to send out messages when necessary, and not failing to join other forces when necessary. Someone should have made an emphatic note of that statement for Nagumo's benefit. During the voyage to Midway, Nagumo broke radio silence for precisely that purpose, and reaped a sour harvest of post-facto criticism for so doing from all quarters, himself very much included. Ugaki had not finished. Enemy submarines have been active of late, he continued seriously. According to radio interceptions, over 20 new enemy subs have been observed lately, while damages due to their attacks are increasing. The utmost alert must be taken against them. Then he reflected for a moment upon US intentions. It is hard to make an accurate judgment of the next enemy move, he said, but according to newspapers they were reported to be heading for Australia. At present the whereabouts of two enemy carriers is unknown, either in Australia or Hawaii. Such being the case, we cannot expect to destroy more than half of the enemy force in the coming operation, so it is earnestly hoped to exploit our attacks as much as possible. Who but Ugaki could thus seriously express disappointment at the prospect of knocking off a mere 50% of the enemy? This portion of the day's business concluded at 14, and the next hour was devoted to another post-mortem of the Coral Sea operation. Vice Admiral Takeo Takagi, the commander of the 5th Cruiser Division, exasperated Miwa by complaining that fortune was not with the Japanese in that engagement. The airman believed that a man made his own luck. The next day's headlines were in marked contrast to Miwa's acid but honest comments. The hosannas of praise resounding in the press mounted to a paean. Joyous news was reported by the Imperial Headquarters Monday, two days prior to the significant event of Navy Day, which falls on Wednesday, Certain results of the Coral Sea battle were five warships sunk. They are a U.S. California-type battleship, 33,000 tons, a U.S. Saratoga-class aircraft carrier, 33,000 tons, a U.S. Yorktown-class aircraft carrier, 19,000 tons, the American A-class cruiser of the Portland class, 10,000 tons, a destroyer, two warships severely damaged.
They are a War Spite class British battleship, 30,000 tons, and an American A class cruiser of the Louisville type, 9,000 tons. One vessel was more or less severely damaged. It was the American North Carolina class battleship, 35,000 tons. 98 planes were downed. That day, Miwa went to Tokyo to visit the Naval General Staff, where he heard another report on the Coral Sea battle and talked with the General Staff officers about Midway. He also called at the Naval Affairs Bureau of the Navy Ministry. The trip was professionally unprofitable, for Miwa received no concrete guidance and wondered how much these chairborne officers really understood concerning the Midway operation. Personally, he savoured to the full this chance to spend two days with his wife. They were both resigned to the fact that for Miwa, to leave home in the morning to work might spell the end of married life. Therefore, he felt no particular excitement on the eve of departing for battle, and Mrs. Miwa, who of course doesn't know anything, seems to be the same. For Midway, May 24 saw the continuation of routine patrols and construction, as well as distribution of emergency rations, which were either stored in dugouts or buried at various spots across the island. Then, on the 25th, 80 more men came in for assignment to VP-44. In Hypo, Rochefort had spent the night with his men cracking an unusually long Japanese intercept and was still hard at work on the translation when Nimitz summoned him to a staff meeting. Rochefort was a good half hour late when he showed up, and the Admiral was definitely not happy. But when he saw what Hypo had produced, any commander would have forgiven the cryptanalyst anything short of treason or murder. The information amounted to the Japanese order of battle, plus a few other items. For one thing, Zuikaku was still out of the picture, and the attack would take place around the 3rd of June at the earliest. This information allowed Nimitz to come up with an astonishingly accurate estimate of enemy strength for the midway phase of two to four battleships, four or five carriers, eight or nine heavy cruisers, four or five light cruisers, 16 to 24 destroyers, and a minimum of 25 submarines. He still did not know that Yamamoto's main body would be included, which was just as well for his peace of mind, for even without the main body, the Japanese would outnumber the Americans in every department. Perhaps predictably, the very completeness of the information roused some suspicion, both at Commander-in-Chief, Pacific Headquarters and in Washington. Were the Japanese feeding the Americans false information? Why was the combined fleet committing such highly classified information to the radio waves? Why send such an enormous armada against such modest targets as Midway, Kiska and Atu? But once again, Nimitz stuck with his intelligence people. Better to base one's strategy upon radio intelligence than upon nebulous what-ifs. Hypo had caught and cracked this vital intercept with not a moment to spare. Having firmed up their plans and broadcast their order of battle, the Japanese changed their JN-25 system, and weeks passed before Hypo could make sense of the new one. That same day, Nimitz wrote to Simard and Shannon that D-Day had been postponed until June 3rd. This extension gave the two Midway commanders a much-needed few days' grace. Despite the fact that both were in their fifties, they were known as the best tennis doubles partners on the island. They worked to defend Midway with the same teamwork they displayed on the court. A World War I veteran, Shannon had an unshakable belief in the efficacy of barbed wire as a defence measure. He ordered so much of it strung around that an anti-aircraft gunner exploded. Barbed wire, barbed wire! Cripes, the old man thinks we can stop planes with barbed wire. Along with Shannon's beloved barbed wire, the atoll had so much dynamite on hand that it actually became dangerous to the defenders, and large quantities had to be dumped in the sea. Shannon shared at least one characteristic with Yamamoto, the gift of instant slumber and equally swift awakening. Although he drank coffee all day, topped off with several cups at midnight, he dropped off promptly. But if anything or anyone awakened him, he was immediately alert. Under such dynamic leadership, the two little islets bristled with barbed wire entanglements and guns. The beaches and waters were studded with mines. Eleven torpedo boats were made ready to circle the reefs and patrol the lagoon, pick up ditched airmen and assist the ground forces with anti-aircraft fire. A yacht and four converted tuna boats stood by for rescue operations. Nineteen submarines guarded the approaches from 100 to 200 miles northwest to north. Midway had come a long way since the day in mid-November 1941, 
When the Pan Am Clipper carrying Saburo Kurusu to the United States was held up at the atoll for three days, to give Japan's special envoy an impressive idea of Midway's strength, Shannon and Simard arranged that a trail of marines plod along the road to the Pan Am Hotel. As the car carrying Kurusu and Shannon drove past the men, Shannon explained that this was a routine training manoeuvre of a small part of his command. Actually, he had routed out every available warm body, including cooks and messmen, for this spear carrier detail. When Nimitz inspected the atoll on May 2nd, he had asked Shannon, If I get you all these things you say you need, then can you hold midway against a major amphibious assault? To which Shannon replied briefly, Yes, sir. Naval historian Samuel Elliot Morrison has agreed with this judgment. Some of the junior officers were eager for the enemy to attack. They had been waiting for the Japanese for six months and were confident that they could not take the island. Others were not so sanguine. On Sand Island, McCall was as nearly pessimistic as a traditionally cocky marine ever permits himself to become. He had radar, but it was old, a Type SC-270, which could not indicate height of any contact. Also, it showed up many blips which might be Japanese aircraft, but might just as easily be low-soaring albatrosses. In an attempt to clear up the situation a trifle, the Marines arranged that friendly aircraft coming into Midway do so on a certain pattern, and anything in that pattern was assumed to be an American plane. Yet the experience at Pearl Harbor, when the Japanese air armada approached within a few degrees of an anticipated flight of B-17s, had already proved the fallacy of such blanket assumptions. The Marine dive bombers were SB-2U3S, officially termed Vindicators, and unofficially nicknamed vibrators or wind indicators. These relics had a habit of ground looping. During diving tests earlier in the year, the fabric parted company with the wings and had to be mended with adhesive tape. 23. The fighter aircraft were F2A3S Buffaloes, known grimly as flying coffins. The Buffalo had been a good aircraft in its day, manoeuvrable and easy to fly but it had a number of flaws which made it vulnerable to air battle, and events had overtaken it. The Zero could fly faster level than the Buffalo could dive with any degree of safety. The F-4F and SBD had replaced the F-2A3 and SB-2U3 respectively aboard carriers some months before, whereupon the Navy had transferred the older types to the Marines. The Naval War College's analysis of the battle remarked of this arrangement this policy of equipping the Marine Corps air groups with old types of planes was a contributing factor to the excessive losses sustained in the midway action by Marine Air Group. To add to everyone's woes, no plan existed for coordinating the midway air operations, and the crews, although gallant and eager, were a mixture of Army, Navy and Marines, unused to fighting as a team. It looked like a hopeless deal, said McCall. A decent battle could not be fought with the material they had, in other words, it was a complete mess. Recognising Midway's weak position, McCall believed the only chance any of his men had of coming out alive was to catch the Japanese carriers with their planes on deck. This meant exquisitely precise timing, a monumental dose of luck or both. Otherwise, Midway would do its best, but could not stand up under a massive Japanese attack. This was right in line with Nimitz's thinking. Balsa's air force must be employed to inflict prompt and early damage to Jap carrier flight decks if recurring attacks are to be stopped. Our objectives will be first, their flight decks rather than attempting to fight off the initial attacks on Balsa. If this is correct, Balsa Air Force should go all out for the carriers, leaving to Balsa's guns the first defence of the field. Of course Nimitz understood the situation perfectly and was not depending upon Midway to secure its own fate. His thinking held no provision for passively waiting to be smacked, but his only chance against Yamamoto lay in absolute secrecy, and that secrecy was, if possible, too good. Certain key officers knew that Midway's defenders would be heavily supported by naval units including aircraft carriers, but those at operational level did not. In fact, shore-based Navy pilots were specifically told that they could not count on carrier assistance. The flat tops would be protecting Hawaii. In view of the circumstances, one can understand that the top brass could not jeopardise security, even to reassure the troops on Midway that they were not expected to perform miracles and that they were not alone. 
for these were men of the Navy and its Marine Corps, and knew well enough that the defensibility of any small island depends upon control of the sea around it. If enough Japanese ships stood offshore out of range of Midway's guns, under a thick fighter cover, the defenders did not have the air strength to drive off the enemy. It is possible that had Yamamoto turned the powerful guns of his main body battleships on the atoll, instead of hovering in the background as a floating headquarters, he might have taken the island by sheer weight of steel. Fortunately for the Americans, Yamamoto and Ugaki were obsessed with saving the battleships, for what the ancestral gods only knew. Ugaki even refused Kusaka the use of Yamato's communications facilities. At that time, the Japanese Navy heavily depended upon intercepting enemy radio communications to find out enemy movements, explained Kusaka. From that point of view, the combined fleet headquarters flagship Yamato was more suited to that purpose than Akagi, whose masts were far lower than those of Yamato. This view was strongly stressed by me to the chief of staff, combined fleet, but it was not accepted by him on the ground that such would result in exposing the position of the flagship of the combined fleet prematurely. Yamamoto was also under the influence of Alfred Thaya Mahan, whose doctrines of naval power expounded in his book the influence of sea power upon history, resisted the concept of bombarding shore installations by warship. So Midway was in no danger of this particular type of attack. Along with Nimitz's revised battle date, May 25 saw the arrival on Midway of a 37 mm anti-aircraft battery of the Marine 3rd Defence Battalion. They promptly emplaced four of these guns on each island. Since the pointer and trainer seats were high on either side, well above the gun barrel, the result of emplacing the guns high on the dune line for surface firing was that the crews were silhouetted on the skyline like sitting ducks, recalled one eyewitness. It is fortunate that no landing attempt was made, at least for the 37 Memamir gunners. Much more picturesque reinforcements spilled ashore that day. Companies C and D, 2nd Raider Battalion, under Captain Donald H. Hasty and 1st Lieutenant John Apergis, respectively, this newly formed battalion, commanded by Major Evans F. Carlson, was destined to fame later in the war as Carlson's Raiders. Their training, attitude and appearance owed much to Carlson's sojourn as a civilian observer among the Chinese communists, whom he admired extravagantly. His Raiders resembled a conventional marine battalion, as a hard rock festival resembles grand opera. But they could fight if the occasion arose, which was all that concerned the authorities at the moment. Company C disappeared into the underbrush on Sand Island, while Company D went to Easton. Carlson, his executive officer Major James Roosevelt, Hasty and Apergis, had received briefing and instructions at Pearl Harbor. There they heard a most amazing story. The Japanese planned to attack Midway. How this information was gained is still a mystery, wrote Apergis some years later. Rumour had it that Tokyo Rose was on our payroll, and through her scheduled radio broadcasts was transmitting information to us. Pacifist elements in Japan, because of their desire to bring about a quick end to the war, were supplying us with information. And last, and most probable, the Imperial Japanese Code was deciphered by our Navy. May 26 was a busy day on Midway, with a B-17 bringing Major General Clarence L. Tinker, commander of the 7th Air Force, and his staff from Oahu for a one-day visit. They brought with them Major Joe K. Warner and two enlisted men, on temporary duty as an Army Liaison Detachment. Nor was this all. The USS Kitty Hawk landed 22 officers and 35 men for MAG-22, 19 SBD-2 and 7 F-4 F-3 aircraft, which the Marine garrison unloaded throughout the night. Of the 21 new pilots, 17 were fresh out of flying school, McCall recorded, Officer personnel now nearly 300% increased, enlisted 50%. The high percentage of officers over-enlisted was due to the large number of pilots, nor were any of the newly arrived enlisted men maintenance types. Midway could not afford to support more than a bare minimum of non-flying personnel. The air crews would have to perform the routine maintenance of their aircraft. Of one thing there can be no doubt. At this stage, Midway was rapidly becoming as well-manned, well-armed and alert as an island outpost could be, considering the conditions of the day, the state and availability of material, and Midway's own geographical limitations. The question was, would all this be enough? 
Nimitz fully expected to give command of the striking force to Vice Admiral William F. Halsey. Half sailor, half airman, all fighter, Bill Halsey was America's best-known carrier admiral. A graduate of the Naval Academy class of 1904, he was a captain and already had a distinguished career behind him when he decided to switch to naval aviation and won his wings at Pensacola in 1934. Since that time, he had served as the first commander of carrier divisions 2 and 1 and from June 1940 as commander aircraft battle force with the rank of vice admiral. His strike into enemy territory against the Marshals gave the United States the first Navy hero they could cheer about in the Pacific War, and as commander of Task Force 16, which took Jimmy Doolittle and his raiders within bombing range of Tokyo, his reputation was at the top of the mast. A tall, rather heavy-set man, Halsey was almost spectacularly ugly. With his deeply carven features and jutting brows, he bore a startling resemblance to Tecumseh, the figurehead of the old wooden battleship Delaware enshrined at the Naval Academy as a sort of good luck totem. He was also one of the most likeable of men, and his staffs and men swore by him. Whenever two or more American sailors got together, sooner or later they would exchange a Halsey yarn, and the best of them were true. The two carriers of Task Force 16 were due to dock on May 26, and Nimitz awaited them eagerly, but with his customary calm patience. Enterprise nosed into berth F-2 at Ford Island at 11.58 that day, and Hornet moored to berth F-10S seven minutes later. While Halsey sensed that something important was in the wind, he had to check with the hospital, for he was suffering from a skin eruption which covered his whole body and drove him wild with ceaseless irritation. Although he tried every remedy anyone suggested, nothing gave him any relief, and he had been in this condition since the Tokyo raid. The doctors diagnosed general dermatitis, probably brought on by a combination of nervous tension and tropical sun, and ordered immediate hospitalization. Halsey stalled signing in at the Pearl Harbor Naval Hospital until he conferred with Nimitz. As soon as the latter's eyes lit upon Halsey, he knew the doctor was right in blowing the whistle on him. The bag of his uniform revealed at least a 20 pound loss of weight, and the dark smudges around his eyes spoke eloquently of sleepless nights. Six straight months on the bridge, except for very brief dockings in physical torment, had taken their toll. Halsey was simply in no condition to lead a fleet into battle. When Halsey learned that a battle was shaping up for Midway, and that he would have headed the United States striking fleet, he experienced what he called the most grievous disappointment in my career. The loss of the Midway command was the culminating blow in a series of mischances for Halsey, beginning with the loss of several of his Enterprise pilots to American AA fire at Pearl Harbor and running through a gauntlet of mishaps climaxed by arriving in the area too late to participate in the Battle of the Coral Sea. Even the Doolittle raid was not an unalloyed joy, for army flyers, not Halsey's men, had had the pleasure of dropping bombs on the Japanese homeland. It seemed as if Task Force 16's original nomenclature had worked its baleful jinx, Someone with incredible lack of imagination had first designated it Task Force 13, giving it for good measure a sorty date of Friday the 13th for its next venture. Two senior officers of Halsey's staff promptly formed a delegation to protest to Commander-in-Chief Pacific Headquarters against this rash bid for trouble. There, Captain Charles H. Sock McMorris agreed that no sailor in his senses would lift anchor on Friday the 13th in a task force numbered 13, he obligingly changed the number to 16 and upped the sortie date one day. On that day, May 26, 1942, Nimitz was disappointed that he had to count Halsey out. As a combat commander, experienced airman and morale booster, Halsey was a task force in himself. Yet, in the perspective of years, Nimitz would remark, it was a great day for the Navy when Bill Halsey had to enter the hospital. This seemingly brutal judgment is no reflection upon a great fighting admiral, Halsey played his indispensable role in winning the Pacific War. His day would come, but Midway was not that day, for the circumstances called for qualities of cool, steady judgment which Halsey lacked. Yet indirectly, he contributed to victory at Midway. Before speeding him on his way to the Pearl Harbor Hospital, Nimitz asked him to recommend a replacement. Unhesitatingly, Halsey replied with the name of his friend and colleague, Rear Admiral Raymond A. Spruance, 
commander of his cruiser force. Nimitz immediately agreed, for he, like Halsey, held Spruance in high esteem. Spruance was not an airman, but he had served under Halsey since before Pearl Harbor and could be depended upon to carry on. So Bill Halsey disappeared from the midway picture to watch wistfully from the hospital on the point as the ships sailed off to battle, then to be shipped, covered with grease like a gun in Cosmoline, back to the mainland for specialist treatment. Spruance had sailed into Pearl Harbor that same morning with Task Force 16 aboard his flagship, the cruiser Northampton. After docking, he went over to Enterprise and was waiting there for Halsey at the time the latter was talking with Nimitz. Spruance wanted to present his own report and to ask his chief about plans for the immediate future. Aboard the flagship, Spruance learned that Halsey would probably have to be hospitalized, but had no idea that he would fall heir to the command. Since I was not an aviator, and there were aviators senior to me at Pearl Harbor, he said, I thought one of them would take over from Halsey. While mulling over the news, he received word to report immediately to Commander-in-Chief Pacific Headquarters. There Nimitz informed him that the Japanese planned to attack and capture Midway, with further attacks in the Aleutians, that we would resist these attacks with our available forces, that Halsey had been hospitalized, and he, Spruance, would assume command of Task Force 16 and inherit Halsey's staff. Nimitz further instructed Spruance to sail on May 28. On the 27th, he would have the opportunity to confer with Rear Admiral Frank Jack Fletcher en route back to Pearl Harbor on the badly damaged Yorktown. As Fletcher, commander of Task Force 17, ranked Spruance, he would head the operation. Nimitz added that after the midway battle, Spruance would return to Pearl Harbor and replace Dremel as the Pacific Fleet's chief of staff. This was not very palatable news for Spruance. Having had two previous tours of staff duty during my career, I was not too happy about going ashore in the early stages of a big naval war. But he kept his poker face, and having received his orders, listened to an intelligence briefing. As he left Nimitz's office, Spruance was somewhat surprised, but not at all overcome by this very big responsibility, and naturally was very pleased at my temporary command of Task Force 16 during the operation for the defence of Midway. His appraisal of the situation was realistic, but upbeat. We knew what the Japanese were going to do, and I thought we could socked, he said. Such mild expression of sentiments was characteristic of Spruance. A graduate of the Naval Academy class of 1907, Spruance was 56 years old, experienced as a destroyer man, an engineer and specialist in gunfire control, when this unexpected challenge fell into his lap. He had served as a staff officer at the Naval War College, of which he was destined to become president as captain of the battleship Mississippi, commandant of the 10th Naval District, and since shortly before the opening of war, as commander cruisers of Halsey's Task Force 16. A slender man with thinning, straight grey hair, firm facial contours, and eyes as light and clear as seawater beneath a high, thoughtful brow, Spruance fought shy of the ubiquitous war correspondent seeking colourful heroes. He genuinely loathed personal publicity, so he refused interviews and permitted no reporters aboard his flagship, claiming lack of room. Correspondents retaliated by popularising the picture of a man efficient but cold and hard. He was not well known outside the US Navy officer corps, and even some of his fellow officers thought him a cold fish with no sense of humour. Actually, Spruance had a delightful sense of fun, but being utterly sincere, he smiled only when truly pleased and laughed only when exceedingly amused, so his friends came to recognise a sudden glint in his eye as the equivalent of a less self-controlled man's guffaw. Nimitz had the highest opinion of him. Spruance, like Grant, was the type who took the war to the enemy, said Nimitz. He was bold, but not to the point of being reckless. He had a certain caution and a feeling for the battle. He was a reticent man who, when he said something, made it count, and he had the courage of his convictions. In many ways, Spruance was the antithesis of Halsey, an admiral in the swashbuckling tradition, who tended to head into action first and think about it later. With Spruance, calm and collected thinking preceded action. Halsey appealed to the imagination and the emotions. Spruance spoke to the mind and the intellect, Halsey often wrapped his thoughts in picturesque, exciting words. Spruance expressed himself in economical, pointed language. 
Halsey loved a good drink and could knock them back with the best in the fleet. I wouldn't punish my stomach with the stuff, said Spruance. Each had his vital, unique place. Each made his own tremendous contribution to the naval war in the Pacific. Nimitz, who liked and admired them both, summed up the two men crisply. Spruance was an admiral's admiral. Halsey was a sailor's admiral. By the time of Midway, the Japanese Navy was familiar with the name of Halsey, but Halsey's friend was a different matter. We had never heard of Spruance, said Captain Yasuji Watanabe of Yamamoto's staff. It was a gap in their education soon to be filled. The day after Spruance's meeting with Nimitz, May 27, Hawaiian time, the US Pacific Fleet base on Oahu fairly crackled with activity. Aboard the warships of Task Force 16, dungaree-clad workers toiled away replenishing oil and gas supplies, loading food, equipment and ammunition, anything that would contribute to the fighting qualities of these ships. Throughout the earliest hours of the day, Enterprise took on fresh water and telephone services from the dock. By 55, the scene slowly illumined with the soft glow of pre-dawn as the gasoline lighter Yo-24 chugged off from the port side of the carrier, now heavily laden with another 82,000 gallons of aviation gasoline. She had already taken on board 19,000 barrels of fuel oil. At 6.19 the sun officially rose over the eastern horizon, and the hum of activity mounted to a steady purr as the light increased. Just one minute after sunrise, the carrier commenced provisioning, a procedure which continued throughout the day. Enterprise and her battlemate, Hornet, were caught up in the pulsing activity of great warships, pausing all too briefly in port between one campaign and another. Daily inspections of the magazines and visual examinations of smokeless powder went off without incident. A steady procession of personnel, both officers and enlisted men, moved on and off the carriers as the many reassignments which go almost unnoticed on shore went into effect in a solid lump. Over in Battleship Row, acetylene torches flashed brilliantly white, Hammers rang, winches squealed, and cables droned as salvage parties laboured to reclaim damaged or sunken ships to fight another day. All over and around the huge base patrol planes were on the prowl, lookouts on the qui vive, guards on the alert. For many still thought the Japanese might smash through Midway and attack Oahu. Just two days before, on May 25, powder guns were installed around the yard two apiece being fixed at Q station and gate vessel, with two each movable guns on heavy foundations located at K station and section base, each gun provided with 66 rounds of ammunition. These guns are to be manned by personnel now assigned these stations for the primary purpose of defending the harbour against the attack of fast light vessels and destroying them before they can reach the gate. And on May 27, the yard again conducted a test alert consisting of a coordinated drill between mine and bomb observation stations, harbour control post and mine and disposal unit. In US Army Air Corps headquarters on Oahu, things were buzzing too. It looked awfully bad, said able, affable Colonel James A. Mollison, Chief of Staff of the 7th Air Force. We figured that the Japanese thrust at Midway would come right on and hit Oahu. We knew the Japanese were coming on in strength and that they had troop transports and were going to land. That is why it seemed so dangerous. We figured, too, that it could be either Midway or Oahu. Not every Air Corps general on Oahu, however, knew about Midway from the beginning. When Rear Admiral Patrick N. L. Bellinger, commander of Patwing II, told Brigadier General Howard C. Davidson, the Husky Texan who directed the 7th Fighter Command, about Yamamoto's bold design, Davidson was both surprised and dubious. What the hell do the Japanese want with Midway? he asked incredulously. Distance and logistics alone are too much for them to tackle Midway. At the time, Davidson did not know about the breaking of the Japanese naval code. Bellinger did, so he was sure of his position. Yet he did not reveal the secret to his good colleague. He merely assured Davidson, I have proof that the Japanese are going to hit Midway. Davidson still shook his head in wonderment, but once in the know, he worked like a demon helping the air forces get ready for battle. Preparations for sea continued aboard Enterprise and Hornet, but it was not all work on May 27 aboard the Big E. At 13.45, officers' call sounded, and at 13.52, the band broke into ruffles and flourishes. The Marine Guard presented arms, 
The bosun's pipe shrilled, and four stars snapped at the truck as Nimitz came aboard. In spite of his urgent problems and numerous anxieties, he found time this busy day to award decorations personally to his officers and men who had formed up in whites on the flight deck. First in line stood the Big E's own skipper, Captain George D. Murray, to receive the Navy Cross. As Nimitz worked his way down in order of rank, he came to Lieutenant Commander Clarence Wade McCluskey, Jr., a top-notch pilot well worthy of the Distinguished Flying Cross. Next to him stood Lieutenant Commander Roger Mayle to receive the same award. Next to the last man to be decorated was Ensign Cleo J. Dobson, soon to be promoted to Lieutenant Junior Grade. In the name of the President of the United States, I take great pleasure in presenting to you the Distinguished Flying Cross, Nimitz said as he pinned the medal on what Dobson described as his heaving bosom. Thank you, sir, replied Dobson. On May 20, one of his buddies had crashed and drowned on takeoff. The two had been good friends, and Dobson had to help inventory his effects. It doesn't seem right for a man whose every idea and thought was so pure and good should have to go as he did, Dobson recorded. Upon arrival at Pearl Harbor, he and another friend had spent most of the day trying to comfort the lost flyer's wife and would visit her again that afternoon. Dobson was not only wrung with sorrow for little Nancy, he was furious because the squadron commander so busied himself with personal matters that he had no time to fulfil this important traditional duty of a commander. Last in line aboard Enterprise loomed mess attendant Doris Miller. He stood rigidly at attention as Nimitz decorated him with the Navy Cross for valour during the Pearl Harbour attack. Miller was the first Negro to receive such high tribute in the Pacific Fleet in the present conflict. Nimitz would have been less than human had he not tingled with pride as the boatswain piped him over the side. He knew, none better, that Yamamoto's great fleet would far outnumber the force the United States could send to Midway. But with his Murrays and McCluskeys, Males, Dobsons and Millers, Nimitz could match Yamamoto man for man without flinching.